All right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to welcome from New York, uh, Jim Kraus. How are you doing, Jim? I'm doing great. Hi, John. Yeah, with over three decades of experience managing market research teams, Jim has become highly expert on intersectional marketing, sales, and product strategy. As president of Buyer Persona, is passionate about understanding buyer behaviors and implementing marketing efforts that understand the voice of buyer. Okay, so Jim, we're going to talk about how to reach buyers at the beginning of their decision-making process, and and obviously. Um, one of those things, when we get into something like this or a recession or a downturn or whatever, everybody panics and maybe they start throwing their nets out wider and wider in desperation, but not really having a good idea who they're going after or why they're going after them. It just becomes a bit of a frenzy. Uh, so what, what, do you, what do you advise for people at a time like this? If they, if they want to reach buyers at the beginning of their, their buying, their decision-making journey, what do they need to do? Well, I think one of the most important things to do now, um, and probably there's some bias here, uh, given my focus on buyer personas, but um, one of the ways that you can do it is really trying to understand buyers, not just buyers, but more specifically buying decisions. So a lot of what marketers are faced with, particularly in uh, marketing and sales professionals are faced with right now in this environment, is there any, there's any number of things that you could be doing to attract new uh, new customers, but you're trying to figure out what are the things that are really going to provide some ROI for those investments, not just in in, in dollars, but also just in resources. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that that we encourage folks to do is really to understand the, not only buyers but the buying decisions they're they're making. Very specifically, what are the things that they're hoping to get from investments that they're making? Um, how do they uh, what are their fears and concerns about making this investments or making it with particular solutions, right? Because a lot of them, particularly for high consideration products and services, there's probably going to be some trepidation about if we make this investment, you know, are we going to get the outcomes that we need? And also understanding, you know, how they're making these decisions. You know, what are the things that they're making decisions on as far as uh, what different competitive alternatives uh, is going to make the most sense for their company? So those are all things you really want to understand so that when you are out there, with marketing and sales motions, you're really hitting the nail on the head very quickly with buyers, given this environment. Yeah, and and I think the one of the other parts too is obviously there's often more than one person involved in buying decisions, you know. So there's more than one personas involved in the in the process. Uh, but I don't think companies often enough like revisit. Uh, their, their buyer personas or they look at maybe the change in buyer behavior things like that because naturally things change it's dynamic to begin with but when you have market upheavals like this it becomes even more dynamic but i feel like people don't revisit these enough they kind of they often kind of do a one and done yeah and i think the distinction too is um two things one thing that you said i think is really important as far as making sure that you're really keen, keeping up to date on what what buyers want, what your marketplace wants, and if things or needs are shifting. The other thing is just, you know, let me throw out a definition of buyer personas because buyer personas is often is often misunderstood, right? So there's one definition of buyer personas whereby you're thinking about profiling different decision makers, different roles in the process. So if you're a manufacturer of, of, of software, for example, you're a SaaS provider, you might have uh, a persona for somebody in IT. You might have somebody for somebody in the business, multiple roles. Those buyer personas aren't terribly useful from a marketing sales perspective because they don't tell you anything about it, the particular decision that those folks are making that you're trying to influence. So if you offer, let's say, a CRM solution, it's one thing to know all the you know, goals and challenges and information sources that a CIO might use who might be involved in the decision. What's more useful is to really understand not only the CAO, but the entire buying committee for that solution, um, five different things. And let me just define yeah. these here because I think they're gonna cast a lot of light on why defining buyer personas based on the buying decision is so critical. So there's five areas that we recommend that you go deep on. One is what we call priority initiatives. And these are triggers. These are the things that are, what are the things that are getting buyers to look at your particular solution at this point in time? What's getting them started mm -hmm. to look? The second thing we call success factors. 
And these are benefits or outcomes. This is how do these buyers defining success? What are the outcomes they need from the investments that they're making? Pretty important that you know that. Mm -hmm. Third thing is called perceived barriers. And perceived barriers are fears and concerns that they have, right? So this is likely a pretty significant investment. It has implications, uh, positive and negative. So there is concern. They don't want to, they don't want to, buyers don't want to mess up. They don't want to make the wrong decision. And we know indecision is a, is one of the biggest obstacles that sales folks have. So you want to understand what those fears or concerns are up front. Fourth thing is decision criteria. So how are you actually going to be evaluated? What are the questions that buyers are going to have for you and other competitive alternatives? Um, you want to know what those are. And the fifth and final one is buyer's journey. Mm -hmm. And that's steps in the process, decision makers, influencers. If you know those five things, it's really going to inform every marketing and sales decision that you make, including top of the funnel stuff when you're really trying to get um, the attention of buyers and you're trying to be as relevant to them as as possible and you're trying to show your unique value as quickly as possible. Yeah, I mean it's 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 fascinating and and I I love the way you serve like prior initiatives and uh, which is always I mean the thing is Oftentimes you find salespeople will will make a connection or something with somebody and they'll discover a, that there's a problem that they want solved and they'll jump on it immediately and they'll think this is great and it'll end up at nothing because it was either never a problem that was big enough or it as you as uh, here it's not a priority initiative either. Um, so I think that you know discovering those or being able to market to those is is so critically important because otherwise you're just missing the mark, right? Yeah, exa exactly. And you don't have a lot of time, right? I mean, it's, you can't, you know, if somebody's looking at potential options, you know, particularly for high consideration type solutions, you know, they're looking to make sense of a market that they probably haven't looked at for, uh, either for a long time or ever, right? So mm -hmm. they want somebody that's going to ground them and say, hey, these, these folks understand me. They understand the, the, the things that I'm dealing with. They understand like, what do I need to really get from, from this investment, right? That's all top of the funnel type stuff. Mm -hmm. And then when you get into some of the other dimensions I mentioned, like the barriers yeah. and decision criteria, now you're getting into the, how do we really convert this business, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I do think, uh, you know, sometimes as amazing as it seems, I think sometimes success factors are overlooked even, uh, you know, really discovering what they are, because it might be, you might think with your product or service that it's obvious success factor would be but it's but different companies have different ways of doing things are looking for different outcomes and sometimes you got to explore those a little in a little more detail yeah no question and one of the biggest benefits of this is not all is you know particularly now it's you know marketers and sellers these are highly skilled people mm -hmm. that are good at their craft one of the big challenges they have right now is you kind of alluded to this in the beginning john was what, what do i focus on Right. Where, you know, where, you know, I, I, there's all different thing, kinds of things I can do, investments I can make. I've got people requesting all different types of things for me. But what are the things that are really going to move the needle? And the only way to do that is to understand buyers and the buying decisions very specifically. And I'll even take it a step further. Um, the way we recommend you develop your buyer personas is go talk to recent buyers. And I, I cannot emphasize that enough. And what I mean by recent buyers is, not your own customers, and that's fine to talk to customers. You can learn a lot from your own customers, but go find recent buyers that made the exact same buying decision that you're trying to influence and go interview them. And, and we're talking 30, 40 minute interviews and really talk to them and understand their entire buyer journey from the beginning all the way to the end and listen for these different areas that I mentioned to and question and probe because particularly for marketers, a lot of times they're trying to do their jobs with one hand tied behind their back because they don't have the luxury of being able to talk to buyers all that much. Mm -hmm. So by going to talk to them, you take all the guesswork out, right? Like all the things that you're working on, should there, there should be no guesswork involved. The information is out there. You know, you just got to go. Do, you got to go uh, talk to them. Yeah, I, I think that's. A, I just want to underline that because I think that's an incredibly important point that you just made there. So it's not just in. It's not just talk to your own customers because you know that's obviously a place where most people would think to start. But it's to talk to external people who who have completed a buying journey similar to the ones that you're hoping your customers would uh, would complete. Um, so I think that's a really really important point. And and then the other thing is, you know, the the perceived barriers. I mean, I I feel nowadays because there's a lot more people involved in the buying process, there's a lot more barriers that they can crop up uh, at times. So being really very much aware of those and the different types and the different scale of them, I think, is really important. 
Yeah, it's it, it's one of my, of the five dimensions I mentioned. That's probably my favorite. If I had a if I had a favorite child, that would be my favorite one because a lot of times when we do personas for for different organizations, the prior initiatives and the success factors are things that intuitively they know, mm -hmm. right? Just being involved in this market, talking to their sales folks, there'll be things they'll learn or nuances or things to emphasize or de-emphasize. De but the barriers are so powerful because particularly for sales folks, you know, they're trying to overcome objections. And it's not just an objection of them choosing you. It's an objection about a lot of them just get cold feet making the investment at yeah. all, right? They're looking for a provider that can make them feel really confident that they're making a good decision and they're going to get the outcomes that they need. And if you know what those fears and concerns are, you know, you're 90% of the way there to figure out how can you, you know, remedy them and make them feel confident. Yeah, absolutely. And I always feel that, uh, you know, especially when we go through, you know, maybe difficult uh, market conditions like, like now is that no, no decision is your biggest competitor in many ways, because as you said, I mean, if you haven't really reassured or you, you don't know, all of the perceived barriers, it's very easy to make a no decision to just go, well, well, I'm, I'm just too nervous right now. We'll just stick with what we have. Even if that's detrimental to them, they'll often just stick with because it's uh, the devil you know, right? Yeah, no question. There was a book that came out of just a few months ago called, called The Jolt Effect. I'm not sure if you ever heard it. And I forget the name of the two authors, but it was fascinating. They did an analysis of a, a, literally a million sales calls. It was all during COVID, right? So the, I know it was a different time in the market, but still, they were able to record these calls because of the, all the virtual sales interactions there were. And they did analysis on all of this data. And one of the really compelling things they found was that uh, indecision is, is, is such a big, big factor in uh, sales not closing. And then the other, and, and that may or may not be very enlightening, but what was really enlightening was the fact that the fear of messing up was such a powerful reason behind it, mm -hmm. right? It, it wasn't that they were saying, we don't want to choose yeah. you even necessarily. They're afraid to say like, look, if I make this investment, you know, the status quo is okay. It's not great, but we've lived with it for a while, right? So you got to get overcome that barrier, those barriers. And mm -hmm. this is essentially, these are the things they're fear. These are the reasons they're fearful of messing up for lack of a better word. Yeah, I, I, no, I agree. And I think sometimes, you know, we forget that it's actually people involved here. You know, people are, you know, humans. And that there's a lot of emotion in buying decisions, particularly in B2B, because it can be career enhancing, career limiting. You know, if you, if you, if I recommend a product and be the the point person on it and I we, we deploy it and it all falls apart and everything, then I look, you know, stupid if it's successful then i look great but these are things that are in the minds of, of buyers and i think we often overlook that yeah no no question about it and the other point i'll make because you kind of reminded me of it john is one of the things that's when you understand the buying decision in this way the other thing that's really interesting is it's not just you know choosing a good let's say we're talking about technology it's not just choosing the best of the right solution that has the features that you need once you start understanding the buyer, you, you start to see like it's all the things that require this investment to be successful. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we'll get into things like what kind of training do you provide? Will things integrate with the different systems I have now? Um, is it cloud based? Because we're all moving to digital, like nuts and bolts type of things where it has nothing to do really with a lot to do with the product features per se. It has more to do with that's great. We buy into the features, but are all these other things going to be in place that can actually make this useful in my organization? And then I can get the, the outcomes that I want. No, absolutely. And then, you know, the, exactly. Uh, and looking at it one dimensionally as in, oh, here's the product of the service that's really going to undo you because that's, I mean, particularly now, I think people are looking for so much more they're looking for human they're looking for human contact. They're looking for, you know, authenticity. All of these, all of these things that if you don't, uh, if you don't really understand that, you're going to lose out big time right now. Yeah, no question. We hear it all. The, the, we do. We do. We're doing buyer interviews every day, and we hear that consistently. Yeah, because one that somebody was telling me about a research recently, and it's just fascinating. The, the thing that buyers and, and people in general want nowadays is just to be seen, heard, and understood. And if you're not if you're not if you're not seeing them, seeing their circumstances, if you're not like trying to really understand what's going on, and you're list and you're not listening to them, well, then you're you just broke three three of the core things that everybody's looking for. Yeah, the other thing too is, you know, I know a lot of marketers sometimes they're a little 
So I don't use the word fearful, but they have some concerns about going out and finding and talking to recent buyers. Mm -hmm. um, I would submit to you that it's a highly enjoyable experience because number one is when you interview folks, they love talking about it, right? Because this was a decision that was su super important to them and there was a lot on the line mm -hmm. and it's not something they're making up. You know, this is not a survey where you're rating and ranking or you're pontificating about how you feel. This is something they've actually gone through before and they really enjoy telling it. And for you, who's really trying to connect with them, um, it's gold, mm -hmm. right? Because now you're really seeing the nut. It's almost like being in the back room, right? Seeing all the things that are that were being discussed and what was really important. Um, it's kind of freeing. You know, you start saying like, oh, okay, we could be, should be doing a little more of this. We want to get more leads. We should do more of this, less of that. We should be focused on this message, less on this. So it's it's a very uh, a liberating, for lack of a better word, for marketers. Yeah, and it, and it's so important because as you know, as as we said at the outset, I mean, buyer journeys are dynamic. It's not like you can map out a buyer journey today and think, okay, we've done that, um, and we're good for the next year or two. Uh, because things are changing so rapidly. I mean, I just give you an example from a company I ran many in some years around the time of the financial crisis. Uh, you know, we we had a customer that's a global brand, well known, and the the line managers could sign deals up to two or three thousand without even having to put it up the line. And then suddenly, overnight, everything, even anything over a hundred grand, had to go to the CFO in Japan. So right. if you didn't know that. You know, you were you were in a completely different buyer journey. So, so always, always understanding what's changing and what's dynamic about the buyer journey is incredibly important. Yeah, no, couldn't agree more. And we get that question a lot as far as how often you should update your buyer personas. And we never really, or I avoid giving any hard and fast rules. My my general guidance is look at your market, right? If it is a pretty static market and not a lot of things are changing as far as buyer needs and uh, competitive alternatives to fulfilling those needs, you probably don't need to update them that much. But if you're in a market that is, you know, shifting because of the economy or the environment, or there's different new competitors, or there's different ways of approaching an old need, um, you're you're dead on. You really need to stay on top of them. Yeah, and and uh, you know, I would I would hazard today that if you're in an industry that stays pretty stagnant and uh, custom, the competitors stay the same, you're lucky because there's very few of those left. I would I would even uh, I would even think that those will be disrupted soon because there's so much disruption going on. So it's incredibly important, obviously, uh, you know, Jim, that that marketers like really put their research hats on. And I feel sometimes like that's something that you know some marketers shy away from. They like the other stuff. You know, they don't like doing the hard yards, if you like, the basic the research, the get data gathering, the extraction of insights. Yeah. So. Um I would say two, you have two alternatives, right? I mean, one is you could outsource yeah. it to somebody to do it, right? We'd be happy to do that for you anytime, of course. But the other thing is um, we approach these interviews, you know, when you find recent buyers, um, you can find them by using different recruiting firms, research recruiting firms that are out there that can help you find them. If you tell them, here's the type mm -hmm. of buying decision we influence, I want you to find recent buyers, folks that have made this decision in the last six to 12 months, they can help you find them. Um, the interviews themselves, I would say the biggest tip I can give you is um, just be very curious. Um, at two, let me give you two pieces of advice. One is have those five areas I mentioned earlier in mm -hmm. mind, right? Those are the kinds of, those are the things that you're really trying to understand. Um, the second big piece of advice I would give you is the only scripted question is right at the beginning, say to them, take me back to the day when you first decided you needed X and X would be whatever your solution is and tell me what happened. And just have them start talking a bit and then just be curious and explore, you know, ask questions like, um, so how many providers did you ultimately um, consider? Oh, X number. Oh, why is that? Why, why those? Mm -hmm. And they'll start talking a little bit more about that and just follow up with probes. It's like, oh, tell me a little bit more. Oh, I, I'd love to understand that point a little bit better. And then you get to the next part where you're saying, well, help me understand um, how you winnow down your options. Did you did you have a subset of competitors you started looking at? Well, how did, how did that play out? What information was important to you that led you to just take a harder look at these and and just be curious, right? Um, if you if you approach the interview as a journalist would, where you're just trying to understand their story, 
it'd be surprised how much, how much uh, really compelling insights you can get from that approach. Oh yeah, no, I, I would agree. I mean, and I think it's a, most people react well to that because it's um, you're showing an interest in them. And if you do it properly, as you said, if you're curious, if you ask a question, if you listen, you validate uh, and you show, I mean, you show real interest uh, at the end of the day. I mean, people love stories uh, and particularly if it was successful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Listen, thanks very much, Jim. This has been great. All of Jim's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your company. Um, sure. So we're Buyer Persona Institute. Um, if anybody's looking for some additional information about uh, buying decision-based personas, or the way I like to think about them is a modern approach to buyer personas, uh, feel free to visit our website, uh, buyerpersona.com. We have all types of information on the site and some free templates you can use. Um, the other thing is happy to, if anybody wants to link into me at Jim Krause, um, I, I try to put out, um, information on buying insights more broadly and buyer personas. Um, I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I would encourage you to go, uh, go check out the, the website. Cause as we said at the outset, there's, yeah, there's still a lot of people who have different, uh, definitions or perceptions of what buyer personas really are and how to use them. So I would encourage you to go, go check out Jim's work. Again, thanks, Jim. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you. Yeah.